Hi, and welcome to an utter episode of Six Five Guys. I'm Ed Mobley. And I'm Steve Lawrence. And today we bring you another in our series around the people, the personalities, the passions that make up the sport that, that we really enjoy so much. And, and I tell you that the most pleasurable part of the journey is you know when we, we come across people that look at established methods. Yeah and say, hey, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. And, they, and they question it, and they refine it. Yeah. And that discovery, I mean, we're, we're doing that all the time ourselves, but also to run into these folks that make their own kind of neat insights and discoveries, it's great to find that out. Exactly. And, and so one of the, the things that, you know, we've discussed a lot and we see other people discuss a lot is around load development. It's, it's finding that, that optimal load. It's a pretty uh, touchy subject. You know, a lot yeah. of folks that have been reloading for years, they have their way of doing it. It works for them. They think that's the right way. And if you're changing things on them, right, because it's sort of a little bit of science, a little bit of art and black magic. I mean, religion, dogma, <laughs> superstition. Right. I mean, I mean, you name it. And I mean, you, I mean, you see people, you know, put up, you know, on the internet. Here, here are my groups. Help me interpret them. You know, yeah. which is which is which is my best group. And so what we're going to bring you today is, is a unique and, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's, a, it's a very fact-based and, and, you know, what, what we think is a, yeah. is, a, is a very solid perspective Absolutely. On, on developing But I think it'll be interesting, load. you know, as you guys are watching this, um, kind of the, the feedback and, and the discussion that will follow. So yeah. if you guys have comments or questions, we would definitely encourage you to leave your comments below. Yeah, and, and again, this is not a Reloading 101 or, or a yeah. rehash of, of your various uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos. That's right. So, so Steve, why don't you, you tell the audience uh, <clears throat> sort of a, the, the, the premise and, and the thesis that's been presented to us on right. this topic. Well, optimal charge weight, right? It's uh, Dan Newberry's method that many of us have used. In fact, a lot of the loads that we're using were developed in OCW, and it works. Right um, to, for a lot of folks. However, there's a few things that yeah, and I it even, overlooks. And, and I even uh, work with Dan Newberry when I yeah. worked up the load for the 260. I, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think for thirty five dollars. Oh, paid his consulting fee. I did. No, I did. Yeah. And it was yeah. it was it was it was really right. good. I mean, yeah. it was it was very informative. Yeah. Now, a couple of things that uh, it overlooks or does not factor in is probably the biggest one is shooter error. So right. even though there's you know a controlled way of doing the round robin on the on the dot drills you are effectively factoring in some element of human errors to get that bullet fired off the same every single time. And unless you're using a ransom rest or locking it into you know, some sort of a, uh, a rig, uh, there will be variants that will be factored in. Right, and so when you, when you look at how the OCW targets are laid out, what does it remind you of? A doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And, and how many people do you know, given, even given all, no time limits, Yeah. How many same people? Load. Same load. How many people do you know can shoot um, a perfect dot drill? Very few. Very few, right? Yeah. And and so when you're doing this OCW workup, you are relying on on your dot drill yeah. skills. It, it assumes that you shot everything right. correctly. And and it makes it makes sense that you know a, a typical shooter is is going to be introducing error. You know, be it parallax, mm. be it you know, how they're gripping their rifle, because when you're doing the round robin method, so because so, that's an interesting thing, you're doing this round robin method that's intended to reduce errors, but in order to execute that round robin method, you're moving your rifle and, and, and everything, and, right. and short of, you know, having a target itself that actually moved, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that is a, 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 probably a non-trivial thing, that's I mean, correct. You, you have to yeah. consider that. Yeah. Now, the other thing is muzzle velocity, right? So optimal charge weight, you yeah. are firing off different loads, which will have different muzzle velocity. But when you actually do the analysis of your impacts on target, you're not really looking or analyzing your muzzle velocity to figure out what is the optimal weight, optimal charge weight. And so, so this is an important thing. So a ballistic calculator is not opinion, it's fact, it's a, it's a, it's a mathematical mm -hmm. calculation. Right. And so you can enter in different velocities, even, you know, 10 feet per second difference. Mm -hmm. And two, 300 yards is not gonna make a difference, but the distances that we shoot at and wanna get good at, it, it makes a difference. Yeah. 
and depending on the size of the target, it, it can be the difference between a, a hit and a miss. Yeah. Now, Ed, would it surprise you that I actually did that and put it in a spreadsheet? It wouldn't, Steve, <laughs> because it, I, I know you dream in uh, in numbers. In Excel. Yes. yes. So, guys, here, go ahead and take a look at this. Um, I actually worked up three different scenarios uh, using my ballistic calculator, uh, assuming that we're shooting 130, 120, 123 grain Lapua Cinars, uh, an average of 2950 muzzle velocity. I worked up three scenarios. Scenario one assumes that there's a, a variance or a shift in velocity of 5 FPS. Scenario 2 assumes a 15 FPS difference, and Scenario 3 assumes 30. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see, as, as Ed, you mentioned, um, if you're shooting an OCW work of a two or even 300 yards, that impact difference in terms of muzzle velocity is going to be very, pretty much unnoticeable. Right, it's and, negligible. And, if, and if you look at folks that you know post their targets up and ask for people to, mm -hmm. to interpret their targets, uh, and, and yeah, you can probably have a really nice small group of two or 300 yards and you could probably have some pretty significant extreme spreads right. and it would continue to be accurate. And yeah. a lot of people, you know, they never get out beyond 200 yards. Yeah. They're going to be happy. They think they found their best load. Yeah. But when you actually take that data, right, extrapolate it out to distance that we shoot at in right. matches, right? You're talking 600, maybe even a thousand yards. Or uh, further. Or I mean, further. I mean, right. I mean, the last time we were at it, almost 1400 yards. Right. Uh, we're talking about a potential miss, especially if you're looking at the high, you know, the min versus the max spread in your, your velocity shift. Um, we're talking a complete miss at your know, distance of 800 or even 600 yards, right? Right, and, and you've got enough variables to, to account for. You know, you've got your wind, you've got, you know, yourself. And so if, if there's a variable that you can control, you know, namely SD and extreme spread, to, to just, you know, have one less variable to contend with, I mean, that's that's what we want. That that's definitely right. what we want. Right. Well, guys, um, let's talk a little bit about the methodology. And to do this, we actually have with us in our reloading room a very special guest that we invited to be with us. Hey guys. Hey Scott. Hey Scott. How, How are you? Doing? <laughs> Thanks for uh, for coming by the uh, Six Five Studios. Yeah, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> that's awesome. So uh, Scott, um, you know, we've been shooting with you. Uh, for quite a while, and you have a very interesting background. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Yeah, um, well, I'm active duty military still. Um, been with uh, some sort of special operations unit for 26 mm -hmm. years. And about four years ago, we decided to start up a, a company, so I own Precision Tactical Solutions, mm -hmm. and we focus in on the precision rifle game. Excellent. Yeah, and, and, and a bit of a plug for Scott. I mean, I mean, here's a guy that, for his job, I mean, he trains the nation's best. I mean, these, these are like serious, call them warriors, mm -hmm. and you, including us, yeah. can take advantage of that training. And, and not, 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 yeah. just, not just field yeah. training, but you train to shoot, right? You're, you're doing weapons mm -hmm. training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we've taken yeah. that training, and, and you know, for those in our audience that, that have you know, looked, at, looked at our progress of, over the past year, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of that, I mean, we can attribute to the training we, we yeah. received from, from Scott. So, yeah. we, so we definitely want to, want to give that yeah. plug. And Scott's a, you know, serious competitor. I mean, you shoot exactly. PRS and you mm -hmm. actually run matches for uh, the Precision Rifle Series. Yep, absolutely. So, so let's talk a little about the methodology. Take us through kind of a, at a high level, you know, sort of the, the four phases that you would typically go through. Okay, well, phase one for me is a I try to take the ego and, like you said, dogma and all the stuff that, um, you know, I might be biased towards, and I just try to get rid of it yeah. when I sit down to the bench. And what I'm looking to do first is I'm going to load, and the loading process is pretty simple. I find case overall length. Um, I don't have any fancy tools for it. It's something I, you know, I just do. Somebody showed me a long time ago, mm -hmm. and it's very easy. I just load a bullet pretty long, chamber it. And then pull it out of the chamber, run it into my reset or my uh, my uh, seating die, and I run the seating die to, down until it touches the bullet, mm -hmm. and then I paint the bullet with a sharpie, run it in there, and then just keep backing it off five thou until I'm no longer touching the lands and grooves. Okay. And from there, I know I've got a bullet. I, of course, I write that down. What, what was the overall length of the O job, mm -hmm. and then I back it off another twenty thou. And that's where I start because most bullets are going to jump twenty thousand. Okay. So to summarize, you're you're starting at a baseline. What you described is going to give you that baseline that's about twenty thousands off the lands. That's right. 
That's right. And then what I'll do if I'm starting with a cartridge that I, I don't have any uh, knowledge about, what I'll do is I'll do a Google search. I'll search online. Sniper Side's a good uh, publication, uh, The High Road mm -hmm. and Long Range Hunting. And I'll take that and I'll see where guys are as far as their their uh, their loads are. And they're pretty. They're going to be pretty close to within a range. And, 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 and if you get your rifle from a, from any of the, the custom uh, yeah. gunsmiths, they'll, they'll usually have a good starting load. Yeah, for they'll you. have a good starting yeah. load. And they'll also have a good idea of where you need to start your bullet as well, mm -hmm. because every reamer is a little bit different. Um, and I'll usually load five five uh, cases up at point o or point three increments. Typically, I'll do three below where I think I'm going to be, and I'll do three over where I'm going. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to be. And that's really, I'm going to load up 30 rounds and then I'm going to go shoot them. Okay. Yep. I'm going to, when I take them out to shoot now, what I do is I'm going to fire and measure. And what I do is uh, I get a target that's small enough that I can still see through my scope, but has enough edge to it that I can corner my reticle. So I'm bracketing. So I'm really mm -hmm. aiming at something that's probably a tenth of an inch. That's what I'm going for. And, and again, all of that is just to reduce that error yes so you're not floating your reticle in the middle of like a one inch black dot or something exactly. like that I'm consistency not, yeah. is everything yeah. right. you're not coming off the rifle a lot i'm not coming off the rifle at all okay. i'll shoot all five shots mm -hmm. from that one position got it okay and and so you said that you you know you make up targets for for each of the 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 five shot uh loads that's that, right that, that you're going to test and so as you progress from target to target do you do you move the rifle or do you go and change the target? What I'll do is I'll, I'll move the rifle, but I'll rebuild my position from scratch, and then I'll stay in that position for the five shots. And and so that would be contrasted with a, a typical OCW round robin, where I'll bet you most folks are not yeah. completely rebuilding their position. No, absolutely yeah, yeah. not. And and be honest, I've got a I've got a rifle that shoots in the tens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shoots a tenth of an inch group. And if I do a dot drill and I spread it out and measure the whole thing. I'm shooting half MOA. I mean, that's about what you can expect. Yeah. You know? Now, as you're sh shooting, you're obviously chronographing. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, are you using, um, you know, shooting over a chronograph? Are you using a magneto speed? Yeah. I use a magneto speed, and um, I had a crony that I shot through and was and mm -hmm. and was light, but you know, it was infrared. And I've been burnt so many times with that thing that I just want to throw it away. The only thing I do use it for now is for pistol stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so I use the I use the magneto speed. I'm not pimping magneto speed. It was you know I spent 400 bucks on it like everybody else is, but I'll I'll never go to the range without it. I always. Yeah, and the same thing here. I mean, we got well. We started with the magneto speed, where where I picked it up at uh, Jake's match, and and then you know we upgraded so it would, it would work with a with a suppressor. And and mm -hmm. I tell you, I haven't used my tripod mounted <laughs> uh, chronograph yeah. in a long time. Now, what are your observations uh, as far as attaching the magneto speed to your rifle and its impact on barrel harmonics? Um, you know, it, it, I don't think it affects my group size at all. It okay. may affect POI, but I don't okay. care. I don't care if it's changing my POI because I know when I take it off, mm -hmm. the bullet will land right underneath my. Okay. Okay. And 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 it's it's not doing anything that would uh, affect like the uh, the SD or extreme spread. So. No, no. It, now if the it, I'll check it every every five rounds because it mm -hmm. can loosen up, and if it loosens up, you can see some real drastic mm -hmm. um, velocity differences. And typically, if I see that, I know that the sensors loose and mm -hmm. I can pretty much throw that one out okay. and we're using a pretty small sample so right. five shots is not going to give you a really accurate um, you know sample yeah but it'll get you started right I mean if right. you want to talk about what standard deviation yeah why don't we do that you know we're throwing out a lot of terms um, typically when you're shooting over a chronograph it'll give you a couple of statistical numbers it'll give you a min which is your lowest muzzle velocity speed, it'll give you a max, which is your highest for that group that you're shooting. And then it'll calculate the mean or the average. Now, the min versus max, if you actually take the difference of that, that is going to be what we call the extreme spread. The SD is a standard deviation, that's a statistical calculation, uh, which is, you can think of it as the average variance. Um, you know, I, we'll show you a slide here. That typically, if you look at your min and max, if you actually shoot a statistical number of rounds, your SD will 
um, three times your SD will, will equal either your min or max on average. So it's a good way of thinking that if you shoot a bunch of rounds, roughly two thirds of them or 67% of them will fall within the range of the SD. So for those of you that are having flashbacks to your uh, high school or college statistics class, Euler, Euler, you want to keep that SD down and you right. want to minimize yeah. that, that extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Smaller right. numbers yeah. are good. Small yeah. is good. Small yeah. is good. And, and yes. over the last three or four months, I've started to really nerd out over this. And I'm going yeah. for, I'm not even really paying that much attention to the standard deviation as much. But I'm really looking for that low extreme mm -hmm. spread number. Yeah, because I mean that's what's going to kill you out yeah, there at that, that, yeah. that distance. So um, once you actually uh, you know measure, what do you do with that data? Okay, what I'm doing with that data, okay, with uh, the 0 0.3 grain increments, mm -hmm. um, just about every single cartridge you're going to come across is going to have a pressure flat spot, and that's what I'm looking for. And and just a uh, the pressure pressure equals speed, and Pressure also causes the, you know, we can argue about barrel harmonics until we're all blue in the face, but bottom line is the more consistent your pressure is, the more consistent your barrel whip and, you know, other factors that are going into it with, you know, the actual ring flex mm -hmm. as well that's kind of, kind of out there as well where the barrel actually, you know, gets bigger at the muzzle. But the bottom line is, is the more consistent your velocity is, the more consistent your barrel is going to release that bullet. Okay. So, it's it's almost, you know, it's not impossible, mm -hmm. but I've never seen it where my worst my worst group or a bad group had low SDs. So what I'm going to do from there, we fired it, we measured it, we're going to analyze it, we're going to find that, you know, you made your most accurate mm -hmm. load or your most st uh, statistically. Um, average load is going to be might be between three of those or the, the point three increments yeah so yeah. back to, um, here we'll throw up a, a slide for guys to look at um i actually you know again me being the the quant guy I just love numbers and doing analysis um i actually have an example of some analysis and you can see mm -hmm. for example in this analysis where it was a, a workup again i chronoed over a, a, a crony beta crony um, you can see that the small SD actually was the, the most optimal charge load. And then mm -hmm. um, you can also look at the shelf in terms of you can see it actually flattens off here. Yep. And it climbs off. And this one right here, you know, is you're right in the middle. This, this node right here is also a fairly tight SD. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, you're... If Probably you're, somewhere in there. Exactly. Yeah. Right in between those two where that velocity kind of flattens out. In between, yeah. that's going to be your accuracy node, and you're going to see that, you know, as that extreme spread opens up, that's going to be kind of your scatter group. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and 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 also another benefit I understand of of, of being in the middle of, of say that plateau is, you know, you're going to have variations in in, in powder dispensing and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So if you're a little little above or, or below, being on that plateau helps mitigate that. It helps a lot. It yeah. also yeah. helps with variances in temperature as well yeah. you know because we know nothing is absolutely right. temperature insensitive so it's sort know. of uh the forgiving spot in the load right absolutely yeah. right right so right. once you kind of narrow that in um you identify that based on your analysis then kind of what's that that last phase that you go through in terms okay. of refining it that last phase i go through through refining it is i'm going to take that optimal or what we found is as our best extreme spread, I'm going to load 0.1 grains up and 0.1 grain down from that load to try to refine and try to find that the dead middle of that velocity curve or that pressure curve. Okay. okay, once I do that, then I know I've got the the most forgiving load as far as my extreme spread goes. And then what I'll do, go out and then I'll start shooting 10 shots. I will load up 10 of those. That okay. way I get a better... More data points. Exactly. Yeah. I get a better... Uh, um, sample, yeah, right, yeah, um, and then after that, if, if the if the round shoots, I don't mess with it. But if it's still not quite as accurate as I want, then I'll start messing with the load length. Okay, and I'll actually go towards the lands first, but I won't ever get it to where I'm jammed. Got it. Yep. Yeah, and, and and that's important in, in our game because sometimes that buzzer goes off, and, and you've got to unchamber that round. And we've seen many many a time 
where somebody gets a, a bullet stuck in that they barrel. Dumps the powder in the chamber. Dumps the yeah. well, and in the trigger, and and, yeah. and I've seen people that, that you know have been out for the match oh, yeah. because you yeah. know they they can't clean up the trigger. Yeah, so, that's why I always uh, ask. You know, can I fire that round? I don't want to pull it out. But you know, <laughs> not every match may allow that. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. and so yeah, so something that you could you know if you could find that spot that's, that's maybe right. a little little back of the lands that that would probably be better. Absolutely. Yeah, especially if you're traveling, you got airfare mm -hmm. into it, you got hotel room and match fees into it. You're talking about a nine hundred to a thousand dollar investment mm -hmm. just to travel to shoot a match, and you'd hate to, you know, have something that's not durable. Plus, you know, if you're having to jam a bullet to get that optimal accuracy, um, that's going to go away. You know, you're going to burn the throat out mm -hmm. over time, and it's all of a sudden that round's not going to shoot anymore. So I try to find something off the lands in order to have something mm -hmm. that's going to be, um, you know, it's going to give me more longevity with that. I might, you know, 500 to 1,000 rounds later, I might have to goof around with the load length, but typically that's not been my experience. Yeah, and, and, and so, Scott, I mean, you've, you've done an excellent job of, of summarizing your, your four-step methodology, but as you know, when you visit the 6-5 Guys Labs, <laughs> we're going to put you to work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. And while we have a, a really good load for our 130 VLDs, you do. We do. Okay. We do. It's a 123 CNRs. That's our practice load. That's what we shoot thousands of. In fact, okay. you know, um, this is <laughs> this is full. It's full of uh, 123 CNRs. Yeah. And um, it's it's a great round. In fact, we shoot our local match with that. Uh, the fact that we have the same rifle chambered in the same way, we can share load data, and in fact. You know, our, our, our dope's pretty much spot on. So. Yeah, and there was a dry spell there where we couldn't get, you know, 130 VLDs to save our life. So, uh, you know, we, we shot these. And, mm -hmm. and, and we came up with, uh, you know, a, a pretty good load. But, mm -hmm. again, we didn't have the benefit of your mm -hmm. perspective. And so what we would like to do is is apply that and, and have our audience uh, come along Okay. as, as, as we... we you know, we put this to, to practice. Okay. Yeah. I actually like this bullet. The first rifle I ever had for a match gun was a 6.5 Creedmoor, and I shot these at, you know, at, at local matches and stuff. Yeah. They're good bullets, 700 men. After yeah. that, it gets a little windy, but. Sorry for the abrupt transition, guys. We had a few technical difficulties in wrapping up that segment of the video, but it introduces a great opportunity to make this a two-part episode. Yeah, and so I'm really excited because Scott gave us a methodology, an approach, some tools that we can use because we've got uh, some load development that we need to do not only on the 123, 123 CNRs. The 130 so, VLDs, the 140 hybrids. Exactly. Yeah. All, all sorts of stuff uh, we, we want to try out. So uh, so that's really going to be the the next episode is as we uh, develop around those projections. That's right. And since uh, Ed... Uh, got a new barrel put on about a month ago, which matches mine. Uh, he's going to actually be doing the load development in that upcoming episode. So folks, stay tuned. And remember, life's an adventure. Stay on target.